Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by MD Advantage Insurance Company. NJM Insurance Group, serving New Jersey's drivers, homeowners, and business owners for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. New Jersey Sharing Network. The Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Gibbons PC. With 200 attorneys, Gibbons is a full-service law firm focused on handling major matters for mid-market companies and mid-market matters for Fortune 500 companies. Wells Fargo. And by Fedway Associates, Inc. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Chamber. Building connections, driving business growth. And by NJ Biz, providing business news for New Jersey for more than 30 years, online, in print, and in person. Online at njbiz.com. Welcome to Think Tank, I'm Steve Adubato. The program that you're about to see was taped in February of 2020. Clearly, so much has changed since then, and unfortunately, a lot of uncertainty and fear remain. But these Think Tank programs and the issues explored will still matter once we get through these very difficult times together. Most importantly, we hope and pray that you and your family are safe. So without further ado, Think Tank. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is Think Tank. We are honored to be once again joined by Dr. John Johnson, who's Assistant Professor of History at St. Peter's University. Good to see you, Doctor. Nice to meet you. You spent a fair amount of time thinking about writing about researching and a book coming up dealing with racism, particularly in the city of Newark, New Jersey. But the larger question of, dare I say, white supremacy, how bad is the problem in our nation and are we dealing with it directly enough? In recent years, it has escalated significantly. Um, it's safe to say that, uh, I'll just say it, I'll put it out there, the current administration in a lot of ways has... The uh, Trump administration. The Trump administration has fomented uh, and really used a lot of these longstanding racialist ideas that have been around for a while, uh, but have really been the centerpiece of their uh, administration. Um, mm. It didn't necessarily begin with Trump. I mean, these ideas have been around for a very long time. What are they? Um, I mean, if we, if we can just step back real quick and I think just define what white supremacy is, I think that's a great place to start. Um, it is the ideas, the beliefs, but also the policies and the procedures that uh, are reflective of and reinforce ideas that suggest that non-white people are inferior to white people. Um, whether we're talking about Jim Crow segregation in the South, we're talking about the institution of slavery, um, whether we're talking about uh, the border policies uh, of using uh, camps or prisons to keep people who are seeking freedom, uh, fleeing for their lives and seeking freedom and safety in the United States. Or people States. coming from certain kind of countries, asshole countries. Mm -hmm. Was that racist at the core? Um, I think it's important to note that when we talk about those folks and where they're coming from, these asshole countries, uh, Let's look at, say, parts of Central America. A number of these people, the estimates, I believe, are 85 to 90 percent of them are Catholic, yet we don't think about them as Christians who are fleeing to seek freedom in the United States. We call them or we refer to them in any number of ways except for their identity that, as people in the United States, we often hold Christianity in high regard, right? As a matter of fact, we believe in religious freedoms. Uh, we support Christian peoples in their efforts to seek freedom and to practice their religion. Yet and still you have these people that are coming to the country who are dealing with trying circumstances, uh, folks from El Salvador, uh, Mexico, um, all these countries in Central America who are seeking freedoms and being denied because of their race. But, because of the race. Respectfully, help me understand this. Do you separate the issues of the complex issues of immigration from the historical American history of racism, including slavery, Jim Crow, the inability to vote legally in this country, segregation, et cetera, et cetera. Do you separate the two? Because they sound like two different issues. I want to separate the two. They emerge from similar, uh, they, are, they emerge from the begin, uh, same beginnings. I mean, we have to go back to look at the early part of the modern era when 
uh, European nations began to explore parts of the Americas, parts of Africa, and parts of Asia. Uh, and as um, these Portuguese, the Spanish began to encounter these people that were very much different from them. They weren't Christian. Uh, some of them weren't, to be sure. I mean, in Africa, there were various uh, religious practices, including Islam and Christianity. But when they got to the Americas, they encountered people that were very much different from them. Uh, different in skin tone, different in religion, different in language. And from that, a system of beliefs began to emerge. Part of that was also uh, used to justify um, exploiting the resources in the Americas. Okay, uh, respectfully, uh, here's, here's my challenge here. Mm -hmm. The history matters. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of folks watching right now, mm -hmm. I can tell you what I think many are thinking. What does that? What does that have to do with today? Oh, it has everything to do with well, today. Well, then br bring, it, bring it clear to us right now, this administration, this country, our country, at this time, as it relates to racism and white supremacy, that history matters. Mm -hmm. And your book, I'm sure, will break it down in more detail when it's published. Bring it up to date. Well, when we look at white supremacy, I think it's used as a means of, uh, of, of obscuring the truth. I would even call it a Ponzi scheme, in that people tend to believe that whiteness will provide them any number of benefits, and to a certain extent it does. Right? Um, they may uh, get hired for a job over somebody who is not white. They may, believe, they may actually get access to a suburban community with better amenities than an urban community. But in the long run, it's not about their productivity as much as those that are controlling the levers of power it's for them to maintain power. White supremacy is a means of causing division. Again, if you look at the history of the United States, when we begin to see racialized differences is when slavery becomes a highly profitable uh, institution. And that's when we, we begin to see the creation of laws that begin to separate white from black. Uh, the freedoms of African Americans, for the most part, was similar to indentured servants in the 1600s. Uh, black individuals could own property. In some cases, they could own slaves. But laws were created to sow division and, and to shrink the freedoms of African Americans. But respectfully, again, mm -hmm. you've got to, for our audience, the history matters. Mm -hmm. But there are some who are thinking Barack Obama was president of the United States. How much difference does that make in the context of the issues you are raising around white supremacy and racism, institutionalized. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what ends up happening is that institutional racism is highly profitable. Uh, one of the- Even today? Even today. How so? One example. Um, we look at the, as much as the United States is moving towards reforming the criminal justice system, we see federal contracts going to build these, uh, these camps at the border. Um, white supremacy is very uh, profitable in the sense that it allows for say, policies that help uh, funnel money to the wealthy at the expense of things that can benefit the larger masses of American people. I mean, if you think about the debates that we have around Social Security and health care, we often think about them and it's framed as something that is given to, these are free things given to people that don't necessarily deserve them. But if you go to Appalachia, if you go to, say, Salem County, if you go to certain parts of western New Jersey where white folks are struggling just as much as black folks, That's right. these are things that everyone could benefit from, yet, we always come back around, I mean, not to say we, those that are in power always come back around to, uh, well, we have to keep these people from taking things from us. I mean, most recently, it was it yesterday? Uh, the As Trump, we do this program, go ahead. Yeah, the Trump administration um, uh, just instituted policies that essentially don't allow immigrants to uh, get federal benefits that could help them become better, more, uh, more productive citizens. Underlying that is this idea that those people don't deserve those uh, those benefits. One action that we need to take that will help us move in the right direction is? Um, I think we have to have more conversations like this and if we say have conversations around white supremacy and racism, the conversation just can't end there. We have to continue to explore our mutual uh, obligations to one another. Um, the university that I teach at, it's uh, founded on Jesuit principles and it's the idea of uh, one finding God in everything and caring for the entire person. And despite all of the differences that are very much put in the forefront, you know, when we address issues of white supremacy, we have to talk about the ways in which uh, people are marginalized and oppressed. At the same time, we have to begin to recognize the commonalities that we all share. I mean, it, it's one of the more interesting things. As Two much, seconds, go ahead. Uh, and and it, it's, it's amazing that um, African Americans, as much as we've been marginalized and oppressed in this country, we've also created uh, the culture uh, that not only people in the United States, but people the world over have embraced. Mm. Uh, if anything, we've created the soundtrack to this country, rock and roll, that all peoples can embrace. And what's interesting is that uh, white artists constantly are 
fairly consistently give credit to those blues artists that created music that was steeped, uh, that came out of our oppression. We've been able to find joy in those things that have uh, oppressed us. Professor uh, John Johnson, Assistant uh, Professor of History at St. Peter's University, one of the many institutions of higher learning we partner with. Next time you come back, let's talk about how divided we are in terms of race and some of the things we need to do to improve race relations in the nation. Thank you for joining us on Think Tank. Thank you. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Think Tank is pleased to welcome Micheline Davis, who is Executive Vice President, Chief Corporate Affairs Officer, RWJ Barnabas Health, an underwriter of our programming, and also Micheline is a trustee of the Caucus Educational Corporation, our production company. How are you doing? I am well. How are you? I'm doing great. Let's talk about, we have these conversations about, quote, social determinants of health, defined <laughs> as? Uh, social determinants of health really are um, uh, the experiences that you have outside of a clinical setting. So uh, how people live, work, age, um, uh, and really spend their lives. You know, it's interesting. One of the areas with your social impact and community investment team, mm -hmm. where I've done some leadership, coaching with them, they focus on a variety of these social determinants. One of them is housing. Make this clear. The connection between affordable, quality housing and health care A, and then B, we'll talk about exactly what's going on there. Sure. Um, well, I will tell you, Steve, uh, the, the evidence and, and research has really borne out the fact that housing is uh, such a, a, a huge determinant about the um, uh, outcomes of health of individuals. How so? And, oh, my goodness. So research has evidenced the fact that housing uh, has literally been shown to um, ensure that individuals quite frankly, have better mental health days, right? Um, have uh, better access to um, uh, other supports within systems. Um, we literally pursue it as a housing first model um, because once we get you into housing, then we can really surround individuals with all of the requisite other needs that they, that they actually have. Uh, but everything from asthma to hypertension, um, stress and anxiety, all impacted by whether or not you have safe, mm -hmm. secure, affordable housing. Micheline, let's pick up on exactly what um, the Health Network is doing, particularly in the city of Newark and in other communities, but starting with Newark. Uh, so in Newark, New Jersey, we are proud. We recently uh, announced a partnership with the uh, state through the uh, uh, Department of Community Affairs um, uh, uh, HMFA program. New Jersey uh, Housing Mortgage Finance Financing Authority. It's not like we don't have enough acronyms. All true, all true. Okay. And, to and, do what, though? Oh, my goodness, to literally um, enter into uh, the nation's first model of its kind. So why do I say that? I say that because for the first time, we are seeing not just in the state of New Jersey, but quite frankly across the country, Country, um, the fact that the state, through one of its state agencies, are literally putting in a significant um, percentage as an incentive uh, to get more hospitals to really invest in housing because housing has such an incredible impact on health and health outcomes. How many units? Uh, so we are looking at between 60 and 70 units. Uh, we are at the very early stages. We have other partners, Penrose, the city of Newark has been a tremendous partner in that. Uh, the hospital association has also partnered with the state in order to make certain that evidence is, is out there to, to encourage more hospitals to do so. Uh, but these partners are coming together in order to do this in a way which, as you know, is really the RWJ mm -hmm. Barnabas way in that we will ensure that it also includes our other social impact and anchor mission of utilizing local professional services, utilizing local uh, employees in order to really build this uh, entire unit up. The individuals who will be a part of uh, this new growing community will be those individuals who a, uh, most individuals call them frequent flyers. I like to call them familiar faces. Which Moving is in and out of the emergency, emergency room. department. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and which so is a huge problem. It, it is, in fact. It's our most expensive door, right? The most expensive door of a hospital uh, is the emergency door. And so as a, a result of that, it really seeks to make certain that these individuals have uh, more than just a medical home, have a home, in fact. Um, but then, in addition, we are also looking to make certain that those individuals who we are locally hiring do not get up and then move out of the city as a result of uh, growing up through livable wage, but quite frankly, find within mm. their own beloved city in the South Ward of Newark, which is a rich history there, um, really the, the kind of, of living environment that they both um, deserve and that they need. You know, it's interesting, social determinants of health, and, and I moderate a uh, quarterly forum, the Newark Community Advisory Board forum that is held at one of your hospitals at Newark Beth. And the folks there 
are from lots of different not-for-profits or organizations, religious organizations, community-based organizations. And what strikes me, I don't want to say it takes a village because <laughs> someone else said it first. Does it take at least a village to deal with social determinants of health, housing, employment, transportation, a whole range of issues. Does it take way more than one healthcare system? Absolutely. Steve, no one entity can do this alone. And if, in fact, they think that they can, I'm concerned. You mentioned the Greater Newark Community Advisory Board. Um, so first of all, two things. One, uh, it takes a village uh, is actually an old African proverb. So no one said it first uh, before, before we did. Uh, so you can say it as much as so you Mrs. want. So Mrs. Secretary Clinton yeah, heard Yeah, she was before. quoting okay. us. Um, okay. And as a result of that... Um, I knew you addition, would correct me. Go ahead. In addition, but always in love. Um, but in addition to that, it's the fact that these uh, individuals who make up the GNCAB, the Greater Newark Community right. Advisory Board, represent everything from clergy to law enforcement, right. uh, the, the city council, to legislators at the state level, um, uh, just across the so board. Someone, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Someone says, what the heck does that have to do with health care, you say? Oh, everything. And it is because of the fact that everything that we do is not something that gets baked inside of an ivory tower. Rather, it is that which literally, we take a look at the data, right, that comes through um, our, our emergency room door and mm. other uh, ports of entry in a healthcare system and, and at that particular hospital. But more than that, we also want to make certain that this is an opportunity for collective impact and community co-design. Listen, we do not jump in front of our community. They know their felt needs better than any data that we could ever collect. And so, quite frankly, what our role is, right, our new mission... As a very large healthcare system. As a very large healthcare system is to make certain that they are in the design seat of meeting their own community needs, right? That we literally are entering into a dialogue with them that is true and real and authentic. And so, when we begin to talk about what are the socioeconomic issues that are impacting you on a daily basis, folks, lots of call them the social determinants of health. Right. I like the term political determinants of health. That has a lot to do. We'll have another story about that one day. Um, but really about the systems and structures that help to create the inequities that we see that show up as poor health outcomes in certain areas, right? Including institutional racism. Absolutely, As a piece of a much larger equation. Absolutely. Go ahead. Right? And so I say all the time, listen, anchor work can really be wonderful. You keep saying anchor work. Explain to me, oh, explain to folks what the oh, anchor means. Oh, absolutely. To... So most eds and meds actually are anchor institutions, but it is Educational different. Educational institutions and pharmaceutical institutions, healthcare organizations. Go ahead. Absolutely. But really, really, um, it, it takes a, an, an intentional commitment. As an anchor, it means that I'm going to utilize our, our place-based presence Presence, right? The fact that hospitals are not in communities for five, ten minutes most often, right? Um, truth be told, uh, the one that's in the south ward of Newark, just because we're talking about Newark that Beth. right now, has been there for almost 120 years, right? The one uh, facility that we have up in Livingston has been there for 152 years. These entities are there for the long term. So they anchor, have the ability to anchor the communities in which they sit. Right? So if, in fact, we were to utilize our place-based presence in order to shore up not just ourselves, but quite frankly, the, the economies of the communities mm. outside our doors, what would that community begin to look like? And by the way, let's clarify, RWJ Barnabas Health, and again, an underwriter of uh, what we are doing, is in a lot of communities. How many hospitals? Oh, my goodness. So we have 11, unless you count the children's hospitals inside of our hospitals, and then we're at 15. But that also depends on the day of week that we're talking about, because I have to tell you, there is so much M&A activity are happening you, across the state. Are you implying that health care is changing every day? Oh, so Michelle Davis good. also, is, by the way, is going to join us on a very comprehensive think tank panel in which we'll be looking at health care issues from a variety of perspectives. What's going on in Washington, in Trenton? and who is involved. Uh, Micheline, thank you for joining us on Think Tank. Thank you. Well done. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Caitlin Wodowitz is Vice President of Public Policy, Planned Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey. Good to see you, Caitlin. Good to see you too, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, help us understand this. What is Title X and why is this such a huge, not just New Jersey, but a national issue? Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about this. Title X is the nation's only family planning funding program. It's uh, been around for decades and was actually started under a Republican administration um, and was there to provide folks with low incomes access to reproductive health care, which includes life-saving cancer screenings, STI testing and treatment, and birth control and contraception. If I'm not mistaken, President Trump his administration, has put in what's called by some a quote-unquote gag order, which yes. means what as it relates to Planned Parenthood and this federal funding. You cannot talk about what? Abortion. 
So what the gag rule says is that any provider who receives Title X funding cannot talk about, refer, or counsel a patient on their options when it comes to abortion. What's wrong uh, with that? I, uh, what's wrong with not being able to talk about it? Yeah, we, say there are a fair number of people sure. watching right now. Say, you know what? I uh, happen to believe I'm pro, they would say I'm pro-life. I don't believe that's the job of Planned Parenthood. That's not why I respect what they do. Mm -hmm. So you know what? That's the president's right, you say? We say that what the opposition to the gag rule that we have is about not having a politician or the Trump-Pence administration come in between a doctor and a patient. So when a patient steps into a, uh, a room for their exam, they find out they're pregnant, their doctor should be able to tell them what all of their options are, whether that's continuing the pregnancy and giving birth, making an adoption plan, or having an abortion. And when a doctor is not able to provide a patient with all of the medically accurate information that they need in order to make the best decision for themselves, their families, and their lives, that's just simply medically unethical and something that we can't stand for at Planned Parenthood. So to be clear, Planned Parenthood then no longer is accepting Title X federal funds. We were forced out of the program because we refused to make our doctors conduct themselves in a medically unethical way. And it's not just Planned Parenthood who believes this rule is medically unethical. All the major medical organizations have also come out in opposition to it. So you're losing funding. We had to step away and we Federal funding. Correct. But unfortunately, in New Jersey, we were very Fortunate lucky. Fortunately or unfortunately? Well, in New Jersey, we are very, <clears throat> very fortunate to have a supportive legislator, legislative, legis legislature and a governor who have stepped in to provide temporary emergency funding in the wake of the Title X gag rule so that our patients can continue to receive the care that they need and deserve. So I want to be clear here. When it comes to this issue, the state has stepped up through Governor Murphy and certain legislators mm -hmm. to make up for the <clears throat> difference in the loss of federal funding yes. so that Planned Parenthood's <clears throat> services will continue uninterrupted, including the right of a patient to interact with her physician and abortion be considered as an option? Correct. So the state legislature appropriated funding and Governor Murphy signed the bill on uh, January 2nd, which would provide supplemental funding in the same amount as the Title X funding, not just to Planned Parenthood, but right. to any Title X provider who was also forced out of the program. And what that means is that we were able to continue to provide care to our patients. There was no uh, difference in the care that they received. No hours were cut. Clinics did not have to close. Uh, and our staff is able to continue to talk about the full range of medical options that our patients need to hear about. Our reproductive rights up against the wall, uh, it's not even the way I want to say it, our reproductive rights at serious risk of being changed dramatically, once again, through the courts? Unfortunately, yes. We've seen states across the country in a race to overturn Roe v. Wade. We have seen attacks um, at the state level that have then risen up through the courts, and there is now a case being Is that mostly heard. Southern, southern states? So, uh, it's all, all across the country. Across the nation. Unfortunately, yes. In 2019, we saw an unprecedented number of bans um, on abortion and on tax on reproductive health care broadly at the state level. But to be clear, a state cannot have a law in place that supersedes the federal law. The federal law supersedes the state law. So unless the United States Supreme Court were to overturn Roe versus Wade, 1973, mm -hmm. I believe, then state law is irrelevant. I'm so glad I get to talk about this because there's a few different ways that states have tried to enact restrictions on reproductive health care, including ways can abortion. You do, seriously, how can you do that? They've done bans on a certain number of weeks up until the, a provider can perform an abortion. So we've seen that in states like Georgia. Um, we've how many also weeks are we seen talking? six week bans. That mean that someone may not even know that they're pregnant yet. Um, we've also seen regulations that are put into place. So, excuse me, you're not talking about late term abortions. We're talking about weeks into a pregnancy. These are the sorts of bans that we've seen across but the I'm country. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, that's fine. And then regulations. So regulating abortion providers differently than any other uh, health care provider. So that can include requiring things like admitting privileges for doctors and hospitals. And you can imagine that when you're in a rural state and the nearest hospital is miles away, that's not simply feasible. Nor does that add to patient safety in any way. Those are simply about making abortion and reproductive health care more broadly inaccessible to people who need it. <sighs> To what degree do you believe President Trump and the Republicans in Congress, particularly in the Senate, where the Republicans, as we speak, have control, to what degree do they understand, in your view, the impact um, that certain policies are having on women, not simply when it comes to reproductive rights, but overall 
health care, particularly for women who don't have the means to get quality health care because they got money. Frankly, this is not about policy with the, with, uh, the Trump-Pence administration and, and those folks in Congress. This is about ideology. And this is about them trying to make health care inaccessible uh, to the folks who really need it, which include women, people of color, folks with low incomes. Why would be that, that to be their advantage politically? I am not sure uh, why they would choose to do something that is just, frankly, it's, it's harmful and it's, it's aimed at just putting health care out of reach for many, which we know has uh, been a broader part of their agenda. Kaylin, an important topic, I assure you, will continue the conversation because what goes on in Washington deeply affects the citizens of New Jersey and other states, which is why, in fact, we have Think Tank. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much. I'm Steve Adubato. That's it for this particular edition of Think Tank. But remember, most importantly, make sure you think for yourself. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by MD Advantage Insurance Company, NJM Insurance Group, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Gibbons PC, Wells Fargo, and by Fedway Associates, Inc. Promotional support provided by Meadowlands Chamber and by NJ Biz. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Cecilia Zalkin. It costs much more to care for an infant than for an older child, and many New Jersey child care centers don't have the funding they need. Because of this, many children in New Jersey don't have their basic needs met. Right from the start, NJ is dedicated to supporting this vulnerable population, children from birth to age three. We know that the early years are the most critical, and we believe that every child deserves a bright beginning and a healthy future.